after one. Love is a precious thing. When you give it freely, it blossoms. The person fills up with that love and becomes good. These recordings were made by a woman named Janere Gerardo a few weeks before she died. When you take love away, it's just as powerful. It can break someone down. Janere secretly taped about a dozen of these selfie videos. In most of them, she is staring straight into the camera's lens. She looks miserable. Bloodshot eyes, dark circles underneath. Her short, sandy blonde hair is uncombed, and the white t-shirt and light brown v-neck sweater she's wearing have light red stains on them, probably a mixture of her tears and red wine. I thought I was a pretty special person, but really I'm not. Janere was falling apart because... In my heart, I had a great love. Her husband of 24 years, Mark Gerardo, was having an affair with his boss. A beautiful and dynamic young woman, her name was Meredith Sullivan Chapman. His whole heart and soul is with her now. I don't want to be here anymore. I just want to be God. The first time I heard these recordings that Janere made, I was in a conference room at an office where her husband, Mark Gerardo, had agreed to meet me. I remember thinking when he walked in that he looked a little bit like an older brother, everyday version of the actor Bradley Cooper. They have the same kind of blue eyes and great hair. But unlike the Hollywood actor, Mark Gerardo is hard to read. He's guarded. This was our first in-person meeting. A few weeks earlier, we had talked on the phone, and Mark said I could interview him for this story. And that's when he told me about the secret videos Janere had recorded. He found them after Janere died, and only his therapist and a few friends even knew they existed. I had asked him if I could look at them for clues as to why Janere ended up doing what she did. And he said I could watch maybe one or two, but that he felt uncomfortable letting anybody see them all. So here we were, sitting a few feet apart from each other at a big glass conference room table. Mark opened up his laptop, turned it towards me, and pointed to the folder of Janaire's last videos. And that's when I saw emotion on his face for the first time. He looked a little bit sick to his stomach, but he took a deep breath, calmed himself, and then matter-of-factly announced that he was going to have to leave the room because he couldn't bear to hear Janaire's voice again. He said he'd be back in a few minutes. I said, okay. He walked out, and I hit play. I just love him so much, I can't take it. These tapes that Jenner left behind are tough to listen to. I've been a journalist for a long time, and I've written about a lot of unusual things, including a true crime series about a diabolical bank heist that doesn't end well. But I've never seen or heard anything quite like these selfie videos, where Janaire is narrating, play by play, her emotional meltdown. I don't want anybody else. I don't want anything else. I would end up taking these tapes to Dr. Romani Dravosola, or Dr. Romani, as most people call her. She's a clinical psychologist and an author. I asked her to analyze what Janaire was going through and dealing with in the weeks before her death and I played her one of Janaire's recordings. I want it back. Please, God. Why? Mm. In looking at this video, Janaire, you know, it is, it's so devastating, and yet it's so classical and universal. It's, it's a woman with a broken heart, and, it, and having a broken heart is the human experience. But what's devastating about it is this is a woman who does not believe she can manage her own broken heart. Why do they get to be happy? And why do I have to suffer? Now, to put that in a normal lens, 
Many times when you see people who endure infidelity, especially in a marital and a long-term marital relationship, it activates an entire cascade of injustice. Injustice is hard for human beings to cope with. Our, our brains are actually not wired to endure justice well. They never have been. You know, at the end of the day, all of us can intellectually argue and understand that life's not fair. But when it happens in our own lives, we struggle. And infidelity is one of those places, especially infidelity that works out for one person and not for the other, can really create a real sense of dis-ease that can cause mental health conflicts, crisis, and all that. Dr. Romani asked me how Mark's affair began. I told her it was in late 2017, shortly after he started a new job in the marketing department at the University of Delaware. Almost immediately after he started working for Meredith Chapman, Mark started talking to Janair about how great she was, how smart and talented. At first, Janair wasn't suspicious. Meredith was married and much younger than Mark. He was 49, Meredith was 32. But then Janair began noticing some unusual things, like how Mark wasn't interested in having sex with her anymore. She saw some strange charge card transactions for dinners and drinks. Mark claimed they were all work-related. But Janair's radar was up now. She was pretty sure Mark was hiding something from her. So on New Year's Eve, while ushering in the year 2018, Janair flat out asked him, are you having an affair with your boss? Mark replied, of course not. The relationship with Meredith was purely professional. He was going through something that many people who are going through infidelities are going through when they're trying to dismantle relationship A so they can go to relationship B because they're still a little unclear on relationship A. They don't want to hurt relationship A. They don't want to be the bad guy. And yet they want to keep relationship B on ice. I call it the butterfly under glass model. You know, that they, they have their butterfly. In this case, that's Meredith. He wanted to capture Meredith under glass and keep her there until he could figure out what to do with Jen Eyre. He lied over and over. I just wanted to know the truth. He can't believe me on. One of the big challenges in this situation is that Mark denied it. When you deny the truth, you gaslight someone. You cast doubt on their own reality. So not only was her reality taken, her love story was taken. I can't go on. I can't see the future. I am too broken. When you're, you're faced with that utter, absolute despair, it's almost impossible to understand it in an adult because it's really, it almost feels like the tears of an infant. How am I going to get past this? I'm s stupid. I'm pathetic. I'm jobless. I'm old and unattractive and ugly. If any human being reflects on the darkest, darkest day they've had with a broken heart, those darkest hours when you thought, I do not know how I'm going to breathe again. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this bed. My heart hurts so much. Take that one day or even those three hours and now you have to live like that every day of your life. That might give you a little insight into what Janair's life felt like. Back in that conference room where I was watching Janair's videos, I had just enough time before Mark came back to click on one more video. It was different than the rest, because in this one, Janair is not filming herself. Instead, she's focusing the lens on her cat, Gypsy, a brown and black tabby. It's just after midnight. Gypsy is sitting up on the kitchen counter, and Janair is petting her, saying goodbye. I love you. Please don't, don't hate me for this. I do, I love you. My baby girls. Love you, Gypsy. I'm so sorry. Janair walks away from Gypsy and goes over to a bedroom where an old white golden retriever is laying on a comfy mattress. His name is Huck. Janair bends down and starts petting him now. I'm so sorry, Huck. What do you do? Next, Janair leaves the apartment. She gets on the elevator and presses the button for the top floor. 
Janair steps out of the elevator. She walks down a short hallway over to a window, and you can see her reflection in the glass. She's holding her phone in her right hand, and with her left, she reaches out and pushes up the window. Once Janair gets the window open all the way, she moves closer to the ledge and points the camera outside. All you can see are a few street lamps that break up the darkness of the night. And then you see streaming headlights from a car off in the distance. Janair tilts the camera down to show the cold, gray, concrete parking lot below. It is a seven-story drop. And now it sounds like Janair is about to leap out that window. I know everyone wants to hear me. Mom, Dad, everybody. I'm sorry, but... I'm not. I don't want to do this. I don't feel like I have a choice. I'm irrevocably broken. No one will ever love him like I did. Shit. It's the elevator. I got this neighbor who's me out here and now I think he's eavesdropping and keep a check on me. I hope he doesn't call the cops because I don't want to be committed. Janair waits a few minutes for the neighbor to leave and then she starts recording again, explaining why she didn't jump. I can't get the momentum. Instinctually, instinctively, I can't get my brain to make me do it. And I don't want to hurt any, anyone accidentally. I don't want poor, some poor neighbor to find me. So Janair Gerardo did not kill herself on this night. But four days later, she went to a gun store and purchased a 357 Magnum Taurus tracker. When she got home, she hid the weapon in the laundry basket. Loving someone unconditionally is a, a true gift. And he shit all over it. I need retribution for what he did to me. He doesn't deserve to be happy with her. On what should have been an ordinary Monday, April 23rd of 2018, Janair Gerardo leaves her apartment. She drives over to Meredith Sullivan Chapman's house and breaks in. Then she waits for Meredith to come home from work. And in the exact moment Meredith walks through her own front door, Janair shoots her in the face. Meredith drops to the wooden floor, her phone and keys still clutched in her hands. Janair makes a phone call to a neighbor. She leaves a voicemail message saying, I've done a bad thing. She sends her husband, Mark, four short text messages. And then, as her final act, Janair raises the gun to the right side of her own head and pulls the trigger. Her dead body falls to the ground just 10 feet away from Meredith. Well, more breaking news now from Delaware County. Sky Force 10 was overhead just minutes after neighbors learned two people were found dead inside a mainline home here. Radnor police say Janair Garrido broke into Meredith Chapman's Rosemont home and ambushed the 33-year-old. She was lying in wait, and she shot her as soon as she walked in, and then she shot herself. The carnage stemmed from a domestic situation. And it was the next day. I was at a red light. This is Sheila Brennan, a divorce coach Janair had been working with. And the Radnor patch came up, and, I, and they said, oh, the murder-suicide. And I clicked on it, and it had her name. And that's literally how I found out about it. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh my. I mean, she had, such, she had such a unique name that it wasn't like, 
Oh, I wonder if that's my client. Shocking. Shocking. So that it never came up. You never thought this woman is dangerous or she's falling apart completely or... Never. She never even said anything about um, ending it, ending her own life or ending Meredith's life or making Mark suffer. Looking back on it, she really did a really great job of hiding herself to me. She did a great job. And yet she... I mean, she was distraught, but she wasn't... She wasn't, um, like there was, she didn't, wasn't crazy. Jeanne Girardo's murder-suicide made international news, but after a few weeks, the story faded from the headlines because no one from Meredith or Jeanne's family would talk to the media. And Mark Girardo stayed far away from reporters until about a year and a half after Jeanne and Meredith had died. On today's true crime. Mark Girardo suddenly showed up on TV, on Dr. Oz. The shocking story that made headlines around the world. Mark also appeared on ABC's 2020. Is there any way to describe what you were feeling? Nightmare. My world was gone. And that's where I first heard about this story and saw Mark Gerardo talking about his remorse and regret. Do you think you could have stopped it? I could have stopped the relationship. I could have handled it completely differently. I broke her heart. Mark also went into detail about how he had spent the last year talking to experts, trying to figure out if Janair had maybe suffered from an undiagnosed mental illness. He couldn't believe she had been capable of murder because Janair had been an animal-loving, anti-gun pacifist her whole life. And then Mark revealed something pretty astonishing that Janair had done a few months before she killed Meredith. Janair had launched an epic secret surveillance mission to get proof of his affair since he was denying it. When people are cheated on, it can set off a cascade of so many reactions. Some people can just say, black and white, you've cheated on me, you've betrayed my trust, I'm out. Other people attempt to have a conversation. Janair had a clear suspicion. And then she went on a surveillance mission that was definitely beyond the norm. I am fascinated at the levels to which people will put their partners under surveillance when they think that they're cheating on them. She would follow him and literally follow him. She would rent cars and then follow them, physically follow them and know what they did that day and know where they went and where they had coffee. Jenner had also surreptitiously attached GPS devices to Mark and Meredith's cars. And then she would say, oh, well, I have a tracker on his car. I have a tracker on her car. How did she tell you what she was doing? A little bit at a time, because she would tell me, she would tell me how, that information that she got, and I would say, how did you get that? How do you know that? And then she would say, oh, I put the recorder into his pocket. I sewed it in, and then I would take it out. There was a voice activated under the seat. Um, of his car. Of his car. So as soon as he started talking, whether it was on the phone or whatever, the recorder would come on. So when she was telling you that she was doing all this stuff, did she did she seem like it was an unusual? Did she realize that that's not a normal, necessarily a normal thing to do? Oh, I thought it was a little over the top. She had the techno- the most modern technology that I was aware of. I did learn a lot about yeah. the most updated surveillance. Janair eventually bought about a dozen tiny recording devices. She would download audio files at night while Mark was sleeping. And then she would sew freshly charged units back into his lapels and coat pockets. She was concerned about that putting the, the recording devices in his pocket was illegal. And I, we had a whole conversation about, well, it's probably illegal, but nothing that you would go to jail for. And then she told me how he had gotten an offer um, from a new employer. And I said, how did you find out that information? I'm thinking that maybe Mark had given Janair that information. So she said, oh, well, I took his keys when he was sleeping, and I went over to his office, and I went through his stuff at his office. And I was like, oh, yeah, that is illegal. That's, I don't know if it's breaking and entering, but it's definitely entering. Like, if you have somebody's keys and you're using them illegally. But so I was like, that is definitely 
Um, that is definitely, like, you can't do that anymore. We'll be taking a short break here, but coming back, Mark Gerardo reveals that Janair left behind more than just those secret audio recordings. She had written a manifesto of sorts, a 12-page last letter. What has the last year been like for you as you try to, as you did, piece together what really happened? So to answer your question, you know, there are, it's been 535 days, um, and I've gone through 76 weeks of intensive therapy, um, and I, I can't imagine not having done that. Mark let the shows use a few clips of Janair's secret audio recordings, and that's what made me sit up and really take notice. Janair had recorded, in real time, not only her husband's affair as it was unfolding. And if you were to ask anybody, I felt more joy more excitement this fall than I ever did before. This guy. This guy. Oh my god. But Janair also recorded her own conversations with Mark as their marriage was falling apart. She's living my fucking life. I, I can't have that. She took my fucking husband away and broke up my family and ruined my life. He did. I wanted to hear more, but Mark only let 2020 and Dr. Oz use a few minutes of audio. I also wanted to know more about the 12-page suicide letter Mark said Janair left behind. But he wasn't going to make that public, he said. And then, during every interview, Mark mentioned this. He had written a book, a tell-all, about his relationships with Janair and Meredith and the murder-suicide. He said he would be donating all proceeds from book sales to mental health awareness or suicide prevention. Mark says he's trying to process this tragedy by writing a book. I absolutely hope that someone picks this up someday and learns from it. Here's Sheila Brennan again. It was, I mean, Mark came off, I thought he came off okay, but what I got from friends and my 29-year-old daughter was not nothing positive. Yeah, that he came off as cold, as a narcissist, as pompous. Um, because he'd written a book and people questioned his money. Because he was making money out of it. And actually, my daughter said, wow, Mom, he's a dick. And I was like, wow, that's pretty strong. I mean, I had, everywhere I went, people would talk about it. And nobody said, I don't think anybody said one kind thing. Most of the feedback to Mark Gerardo's interviews was blistering. These are some of the comments posted on the show's Facebook pages. They're being read by actors. Oh, boo-hoo for the pathetic husband. I was so angry, I could hardly watch the whole interview. I love you, Dr. Oz, but I totally believe he played you. Mark Gerardo, what an insincere narcissist. A jerk among jerks. If Janair had a mental illness, it was temporary insanity. How can you try to make money off of two women you destroyed? Burn in hell, you motherfucker. Mark didn't shoot the gun, but he loaded it. You seem to me to be a complete narcissist as I watch you speak with no remorse for what you caused. Your actions have destroyed so many people, you are selfish. I am shocked at the way the show is portraying his wife. Tagging her with a mental illness? How disgusting. Was she mentally ill for this to happen, or did it cause her to mind to go haywire? One of the big questions any mental health professional struggles with is, isn't everybody who commits murder mentally ill? To which most of us would say no, not necessarily. Um, Mental illness is not solely defined by the behaviors one engages in. And the behavior somebody may engage in at a certain moment may or may not define mental illness. Now, if we take the behavior out of it, we take the the, the violent acting out at the end of Janair's story. There were many other things that came out in Janair's story that would raise concerns about mental health issues. 
One of the hypotheses we do often want to explore is whether there was a history of trauma. Now, whether that translated into full-blown PTSD or a syndrome in mental health that's labeled complex PTSD. Complex PTSD is a phenomenon that's evolving and we're learning more and more about. Now, the idea is, and this is a question that's brought up over and over again, is infidelity a trauma? I think there's going to be a lot of divisive discussion about that in mental health circles. And as somebody who's worked with survivors of marital infidelity, I can see what it's done to them. And it feels like trauma. They have nightmares about it. They find themselves that they're more edgy than usual. They can't settle in. They feel socially isolated. This is all the stuff we see in trauma survivors. She had a therapist. She had a divorce coach. She mm-hmm. didn't tell any of these people that she was buying mm-hmm. a gun. The fact that Janair was able to plan this so well and as well as inhibit informing other people around her about this, meant that she clearly had the bandwidth, the psychological bandwidth, to know right from wrong. The deliberate not sharing of the information really leads one to to contemplate Janair's commitment to ensuring that the story of Meredith and Mark wouldn't persist. There's something the author Ernest Hemingway once wrote that reminds me of this tragedy. In his book, A Farewell to Arms, Hemingway writes, The world breaks everyone eventually. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. Janair, at the end of her life, couldn't break and get strong. Instead, she went to a very dark place, destroying two lives in an instant, and then delivering a twist ending. Why do you think she didn't kill Mark? That's the piece that might confuse people around the crime of passion piece. Why didn't she kill him? We can only reflect on what her motives were. It was almost more sinister for somebody to have to live with that. And there's also almost like the leaving of the trophy, right? Mark would forever have to live with these stories the loss of Meredith, the loss of Jenner. He walks around the world forever carrying this story on his soul. I mean, that's its own form of soul death, right? So she she got everyone in the story in this almost more sinister way. We've all heard about crimes where a jealous spouse kills their partner, their lover, maybe themselves. But what Jenner did is a highly unusual, if not a -a one-of-a-kind case. And the why of it all is what's so confounding. I mean, so many people, me included, have been blindsided by betrayal. But we move on and rebuild new lives. Why couldn't Janair? And how much of this really had to do with how Mark Gerardo handled things? And as for Meredith Chapman, she was the other woman. But her punishment certainly didn't fit this crime of the heart. Why did Janair have to kill her? Whenever we look at a story of evil, we see the top of the iceberg. When we go deeper into Janair's story, this is a tragedy. This is a story of despair, of loss, of confusion. It all comes down to where you decide to tell the story. If you put the lens solely on the murder, she's a monster. If you put the lens on the despair, you're left with a much more complicated story. And that's why I was in that conference room with Mark Gerardo, to try and understand how Janair went from being an anti-gun pacifist to buying a gun and becoming an executioner in just a few weeks. The answers are in everything Janair left behind. But Mark Gerardo hesitated when I asked him to have unrestricted access to everything that had been on Janair's computer. Her emails, the secret audio tapes, the selfie videos, her suicide letter. Mark asked if I could tell the story without them. I asked him if he had something to hide. He said no. He was just worried that all of this would make Janair look crazy. And she'd been so much more than that. Then he blurted out that he still loved her. We sat in silence for a few moments. And I made a mental note to ask Mark later, during an interview that we had planned to tape how he felt about Meredith now. And then Mark spoke up. He said he would let me download Janair's materials. Some people will say Mark Gerardo did this in order to sell books. 
And I'm fully aware he probably didn't give me everything, he said, he found after Janair died. But frankly, and I never told him this, I'm surprised he gave me what he did. He's not getting paid. He has no control over how this story will be told. And none of it makes him look good. Which I realized after I got back to my office and spent the next few weeks going through Janair's evidence, starting with those audio recordings where you can hear Mark not giving her what she needed, the truth. Everyone else is telling me, wake up, girl. Everyone else is telling you that? Yes. Everybody says it's over. I need to hear from you. I need to know. When I looked at Janair's digital records, I discovered something else that hadn't been made public. She actually recruited an accomplice to help her expose Mark and Meredith's affair. That person revealed secrets Meredith was hiding from everyone. There's more to her story, too. But it is those selfie videos that are most illuminating. It's as if Janair was anticipating the questions that would be asked after she was gone. I'm not making excuses, but I will take accountability that... My investigation for the truth. Recording them hacking into their phones and their computers and tracking them. It's not me. It's not what I wanted to do. But it was the only thing I knew how to do to get the answers. At first it was the truth that he was having an affair that was very clear oh, right off the start but then I wanted to know what I was up against was it really love for him or was it just sex or an affair I, I needed to know the strength and the parameters of what this was about because he wouldn't tell me anything. He just lied. I, I think Janair's side of the story is in incredibly, incredibly important because I think that it's the, you know, we, we are living in an era of despair in many ways. A lot of people are in a lot of pain. Most people will bear up to, under that pain fine. It may it may, it may be uncomfortable, stress, anxiety, but m more people than we'd like suffer under that despair. We are seeing upticks in drug overdoses, reliances on substances and alcohol, and suicide like we haven't seen in the history of this country. When I started reading Janair's last letter, it made me feel so uneasy, kind of like looking at a train wreck and you can't turn away. Janair writes eloquently about her sorrow, but then she unleashes on Meredith and in great detail reveals why Meredith must die and how she's going to make it happen. It feels like heat is coming off the pages. And I wondered if Janair ever meant for anyone to read this. But then I got to the end of her letter, and there it was, Janair's dying wish. She wanted us to bear witness, to hear her side of the story. In one of her final paragraphs, Janair writes, Tell anyone and everyone the truth behind all of this. I am not a crazy, lunatic, unstable, scorned wife who went off the deep end. I just begged him and begged him. If we are over and this is done, please be honest with me. If we have a chance, please be honest with me. You can't believe me on jerking me around. It was emotional abuse. I would have never done these things if he just told the truth from the beginning. He turned me into a monster because he doesn't know anything about honesty. And I'm so ashamed that I loved him. Thanks for listening. In future episodes, you'll get to hear those secret recordings Janair made and were able to share for the first time publicly what she wrote in her 12-page suicide letter. But first, up next in episode two of Bad Bad Thing, Mark and Janair's love story 
and the man who warned Mark from the beginning not to marry her. <laughs> 